Most people think that socialism and communism were created by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. In fact, both these ideas, socialism and communism, predate Marx and Engels. What they did add to the ideas of socialism and communism is the notion that uh, uh, these ideas themselves need to be rethought out on scientific foundations. So they characterized all earlier socialists as utopian thinkers or utopian socialists, and they wanted to base their socialism on the foundation of modern scientific investigation. So in this great work, The Development of Utopian Socialism by Frederick Engels, they try to point out the origins of modern as opposed to uh, pre-modern socialism. And they point to three major factors that led to the development of scientific or modern socialism. The first, they say, is the class antagonism between proprietors and non-proprietors, that is, between capitalists and workers. The second is the anarchy existing in production. They felt that this anarchy must come to an end and only socialism could bring it to an end. And thirdly, in theoretical form, socialism was considered to be the logical extension of the principles laid down by the great French philosophers of the 18th century. Now let's go back into the 18th century and uh, think about the transformations that had already occurred in Europe and were occurring even at that time. The main transformation, of course, was the Enlightenment. This was the kingdom of reason. Religion, natural science, society, political institutions, everything was subjected to the most unsparing and ruthless criticism. Superstition, injustice, privilege, oppression were to be superseded by eternal truths, eternal right, equality based on nature and the inalienable rights of man. But Marx and Engels argue that enlightenment was nothing other than the idealized kingdom of the capitalist class, of the bourgeoisie. Eternal right was found in the realization of equality before the law, but not in real social equality, not in economic terms at all. Bourgeois property was proclaimed as the essential rights of man. The government of reason, the social contract of Rousseau came into being and could only come into being as a democratic bourgeois capitalist republic. So in other words, all of this basically gave rise to modern capitalist forms of governance and society, these thinkers could not go beyond the limits imposed upon them by their epoch. But already in this period, Marx and Engels say, the forerunners of the modern working class, the modern industrial proletariat had come into being. At this point in time, the antagonism between exploiters and exploiters was such that it allowed the capitalist class to put itself forward as representing not one special class, not capitalist interests, but the whole of suffering humanity. That's how the middle class really came to acquire the hegemony over the working classes. But the capitalist class was always going to be saddled with its own antithesis. Capitalists cannot exist without industrial wage workers. And in every bourgeois movement, there were outbursts of these very forerunners, the Anabaptists and Thomas Munzer, the levelers in the English Revolution and Babouef in the French Revolution. The theoretical enunciations of a class that had not yet developed could already be seen in the 16th and 17th century utopian pictures of ideal social conditions. You must have heard, of course, of Thomas More's great book, Utopia, but in, by the 18th century, you actually had communist theories such as Morley and Mabley. And not just, they were not just talking about political equality, but now they were talking about economic and social equality. They were talking about the abolition of all class distinctions. So this early form of communism was ascetic. They thought that we should live without luxuries. We should live without, uh, you know, a house or good clothes, etc. It denounced all the pleasures of life. It was very Spartan. Um, these were the new forms of teaching. And when I look at Pakistan, for example, and people who criticize communism, I often see that they mistake this ascetic communism for modern communism. They mistake the idea that all communists must live in penury and poverty, and they don't realize that, in fact, modern communism is doesn't admire or love po poverty at all. In fact, its great goal is the elimination of exploitation and therefore inequality and poverty.
Now, three great utopian socialists were born in this period and this essay really is about their contribution to socialism and to history and how Marx and Engels want to differentiate themselves from these three great utopian socialists. They were Saint Simon, Charles Fourier and Robert Owen. These three thinkers considered themselves, they all came at different periods, uh, but roughly in the same hundred years, they considered themselves as emancipators of all of humanity, that they were not going to emancipate a specific class, they were not going to emancipate the poor, but they were going to emancipate all of humanity at once, the rich and the poor. They thought that the capitalist world is basically unjust because it is irrational. If it were to be based on pure reason, justice would then prevail. The only reason that injustice has prevailed is because reason has either not been fully understood or if it has been understood, it has not been fully implemented in, in every aspect of our lives. It has not transformed every aspect of our lives. So they were really very much, in a certain sense, enlightenment thinkers themselves. The individual man of genius could have liberated the world at any time in history uh, is one of the conclusions that follows from utopian thinkers. So you didn't need the development of industry and thought to come to a certain stage for the development of socialism to come about, for a socialist revolution to come about. Socialism or communism could have come about in the time of Jesus Christ or in the time of any of the great prophets or at any time in history if mankind had just grasped the principles of logic and reasoning. Now, all these three great utopian socialists were uh, really children of the French Revolution. Some very directly, they even participated in the French Revolution and some in the intellectual sense. But all three of them were disappointed with the French Revolution and the results of the French Revolution. Rousseau's great social contract became the reign of terror. The corruption of the directorate was in front of everyone. And finally, of course, the French Revolution became Napoleonic despotism. That was not what the French Revolution was intended to become. It was going to be a democratic republic, but ended in despotism. So it, the ideas of eternal peace that the French Revolution had promised became an endless war of conquest with Napoleon. And the antagonism between the rich and the poor, instead of coming down, had only intensified. In fact, mass poverty came about after the French Revolution, although it existed, of course, also before the French Revolution. The freedom of property became freedom from property, right, Marx and Engels, that the vast majority of people now had no access whatsoever to property. Even the serfs who were tied to the land now became completely isolated from any form of common property. Trade became cheating. Cash payment became the sole nexus between man and man. Force was replaced by corruption, the sword by gold. Now everything could be done just by buying someone. If in an earlier epoch, um, you had to use force, you had to use the sword in order to compel other people to do your bidding. In the epoch after the French Revolution, all you needed was money. And that really defines not just France after the revolution, it really defines the whole of the modern period. The right of the first night was transferred to the bourgeois manufacturers. This is a pretty horrific idea that did exist in medieval Europe, which is that uh, the first night that a woman would be married to another man, she would actually spend with the, with, um, with the feudal lord. Uh, and Marx and Engels says this is now transferred only to the bourgeois manufacturer. Prostitution didn't decline but increased. Marriage remained the legally recognized form of prostitution supplemented by adultery rights angles. This was the reality of French society after the French Revolution. Now, the utopian socialists expressed this disappointment with the French Revolution. First and foremost, in 1802, came Saint Simon's Geneva Letters. In 1808, Fourier's first great work. In 1800, Robert Owen undertook the direction of New Lanark and transformed that factory into a factory that was really working for working people. I'll speak about each of these briefly in just a little bit. But the 1800s was a period where the proletariat, the working class, the industrial proletariat was as yet extremely primitive. Uh, the conflicts arising from capitalism at this point in history were only just beginning to take shape. The proletariat was evolving from the have 
nothing masses. It was therefore incapable of independent political action. They were an oppressed, suffering order to whom help could at best be brought from above. You could give them charity, but they were in such a mess, they were in so, so, such chaos that they couldn't organize themselves. Many, many a times when I read this passage, I think of the proletariats of Pakistan. That although there are many, many proletariats in Pakistan, help can be brought to them from above. But as yet, we don't see, across Pakistan at least, um, the proletariat or the working class organized as an independent political force. So these crude capitalist conditions, writes Engels, led to equally crude theories about socialism and about how to transform these conditions. Society presented nothing but wrongs. Everything was wrong. Reminds me of social media today, where, where young people talk about all the, the all the social ills that they see in society, all the wrongs that they see in society, but they are as yet, perhaps, not able to present an alternative to those wrongs. To remove these was the task of reason, the utopian socialists felt. Attempts to discover a new perfect system and impose this by propaganda and by example of model experiments was the order of the day for these thinkers. These new social systems sadly were foredoomed as utopian, says Engels. They could not have survived. Now let's begin with the first great utopian thinker, Saint Simon, who lived from 1760 to 1825. He was quite literally a child of the French Revolution. He participated in the French Revolution, but his great contribution is not that participation, but really the examination of the French Revolution as class war. The French Revolution was a class war between nobility on the one hand and the bourgeoisie, that is the capitalist class, and the non-possessors, the poor on the other hand. So you have the landlords, and the middle classes and poor people on the other side. This antagonism was reflected in the antagonism between the third estate, which represented the poor, and the privileged classes. Politics, therefore, St. Simon said, is the science of production. A phrase that's often used is that politics is concentrated economics. That's a phrase used by Lenin and many other Marxists. And of course, Marxists are always sort of blamed for economic reductionism. But really, it's Saint Simon who begins with this idea that politics is the science of production. And you can see the influence of Saint Simon on Marx and Engels because they take forward this very idea. Similarly, Saint Simon also gave the idea of the abolition of the state. He stated that politics would be up slowly and over time absorbed by economics. That is, the administration of things, of economic resources, would become the most important question. And the political state, the repressive political state, would be abolished. This idea is also, of course, present in the works of Marx and Engels as the withering away of the socialist state. Saint Simon argued for an alliance of France and England and Germany for peace in Europe in 1815. And this was, a, this was a very difficult argument to make at that particular point in time, because France and England in particular were constantly at war with one another. The bourgeoisie had grown rich through speculation in the lands of the nobility and church, and partly by frauds upon the nation by means of army contracts. And Saint Simon had noted this particular way uh, this particular development of French society after the French Revolution. And he made a class analysis of France in which he said there are basically two types of people. On the one hand are people who sit idle. He called them idlers. They don't do any work. They are very, very rich. They make money because they have property. And on the other hand are people who work. Now these could be middle class people. They could be people who are bourgeois. They could be capitalists. If they go to fac their factories and they do actual sort of work, then he didn't consider them to be idlers, he considered them to be workers. So the idlers were the old privileged classes and all who lived on their incomes without taking any part in actual production. Workers on the other hand of course were wage workers but also in, for Saint Simon manufacturers and merchants and even bankers because he thought all of these people do some real work hence should be counted as workers. 
From this, Saint Simon concluded that utopia, a socialist society, would be built on the foundation of science and industry, which would be united by a mystic and rigidly hierarchical new form of Christianity. So he also wanted to mix a little bit of religion into this entire framework. Scholars, working bourgeois, manufacturers, merchants and bankers would become public officials of social trustees. They would take care of the capital of society on behalf of society. Bankers, for example, would direct the whole of social production by the regulation of credit, something that does happen in modern capitalist societies. Bankers really control the direction and pace of economic development in nearly all advanced capitalist societies, including Pakistan. But for Saint Simon, they were supposed to have done that as a public trust rather than for private gain. All men ought to work, said Saint Simon. So next up, we have Francois Marie Charles Fourier. He was born in 1772 and he passed away in 1837. And he's considered one of the greatest satirists of all times. He was the Habib Jalib of his period. He had modern sarcasm. He would compare the dazzling promises of the Enlightenment, the kingdom of reason, of a civilization on which happiness should be universal, of an illimitable human perfectibility, and the rose-colored phraseology of the bourgeois ideologies of his time with the actual social reality, with what really existed in France. He pointed out how everywhere the most pitiful reality corresponds with the most high sounding phrases. And he overwhelms this hopeless fiasco of phrases with his mordant sarcasm. You know, I think if there is a socialism in Pakistan today, and of course there is, it is relied primarily on this sort of criticism of Pakistan as well. Because what we see in our own country are these incredibly highfalutin phrases, especially in the Urdu language, which is very, very open to such romantic sort of phrases, together with the most pitiless poverty and conditions that one can think of. Fourier depicted with equal power and charm the swindling speculations that blossomed out upon the downfall of the revolution and the shopkeeping spirit prevalent in and characteristic of French commerce at the time. Fourier gave us the idea that there were four main stages of evolution in human history. The first was savagery, next came barbarism, third was the patriarchate, and last but not least, civilization. Though it must be noted that for him the term savagery and barbarism didn't have the negative connotations that they do today. Of course, his greatest interest is bourgeois civilization, capitalist civilization, modern civilization, about which he said, civilization moves in a vicious circle, in contradictions which it constantly reproduces without being able to solve them. Hence, it constantly arrives at the very opposite to that which it wants to attain or pretends to want to attain. So that, for example, under civilization, poverty is born of superabundance itself. When we think of modern society and all the promises of modern society and we compare them to the reality, we can't help but think that there must be something absolutely insane about the situation. We are talking about, you know, eliminating poverty and eliminating all forms of exploitation. These phrases are even in the constitution of Pakistan. Yes, that's right. The phrase that uh, all forms of exploitation will be eliminated in Pakistan is there in the constitution of Pakistan today. And yet, when you look around in Pakistan, you see indentured labor, you see bonded labor, you see people begging on the streets and so on. Nothing can be further from, you know, what is stated in the constitution. Fourier also looked at history in a very dialectical way. He argued against the idea that human perfectibility had no limit. He argued that every historical phase has its period of ascent and also its period of descent. Civilizations rise, just as empires rise, civilizations rise and civilizations must fall. And in much the same way, humanity itself has a period of its infancy, its maturity, and will inevitably have a period of its decline. Fourier therefore introduced into historical sciences the idea of the ultimate destruction of the human race itself. Fourier 
also was a critic of the Industrial Revolution. He saw how steam and tool making machinery were transforming manufacture into modern industry. And he also saw the social results of the Industrial Revolution. He looked at the speed of development and how it was becoming a storm. Society was being torn into large capitalists and non-possessing proletariats on the other side. Poverty, homelessness, loosening of all traditional moral bounds of patriarchal subordination, destruction of family relations, frightful overwork, especially of women and children, and the complete demoralization of the working class. These were the features that um, Fourier saw in his own time and spoke about with incredible eloquence. Engels mentions Robert Marcus Owen, who was born in 1771 and passed away in 1858. Now, Owen was born in a capitalist family. He was a rich man. Uh, he came forward as a reformer first, as a manufacturer, who was at the age of 29. Um, Engels writes about him that he had he was a man of almost sublime childlike simplicity of character and yet at the same time he was a born leader of men. Now Robert Owen was a materialist thinker that means that he thought that the character of a person was produced by the environment of the individual especially during their childhood. If you change the environment he argued you can change man's nature. A lot of times we get into arguments about uh, whether or not man has a nature, whether man's nature is immutable, whether socialism accords or does not accord with man's nature, whether capitalism is compatible with human nature and so on and so forth. Well, Owen thought that man's nature changes with a changing environment. So when he took over the factory at New Lanark, he wanted to try out his materialist philosophy, his materialist thinking. And how did he do that? Well, he thought, how about placing people in conditions worthy of human beings, especially by carefully bringing up the rising new generation, young people. So he was a founder of infant schools. At the age of two, children came to school where they enjoyed themselves so much that they could scarcely be got home again. He started this movement that very young kids should go to school or these were kids of workers and for workers themselves he created, he used the profits of his factory for the welfare of his employees. Uh, and so while his competitors worked their workers 13 or 14 hours a day in his factory in New Lanark, the working day was only 10 and a half hours, which by that, by the standards of that time was actually very, uh, you know, much better than what was going on everywhere else. And when a crisis in cotton stock worked for four months, his workers received their full wages throughout those four months. He made sure that they never starved. And with all this, uh, the best part is that the business more than doubled in value and to the last yielded large profits to its proprietors. He never made a loss. In fact, he made more profit by treating his workers well. But, and here's the greatest irony, Owen could have rested on his laurels as a great manufacturer and as a philanthropist, but he was still not content. He wrote, the people were slaves at my mercy. At the end of the day, I was taking the decision on their behalf. If I paid them well, they were well off. If I didn't pay them well, they would not be well off. So this was not what re he really wanted. He didn't want workers to be at the mercy of capitalists. To the workers, the fruits of this new power belong, he thought. Workers are creating all of this social wealth and it is to them that all of this social wealth, this new power ought to belong. That is, industrial machinery was being used to enrich the capitalists and to enslave the masses, but industrial machinery ought to be used for the welfare of people themselves. It must be used, therefore, as common property and worked for the good of all. Industrial machinery, Owen argued, can build a new society where everybody is better off. And thus Owen arrived at his ideas of communism. Now this was a, a very business-like communism. It was based purely upon a business foundation and upon commercial calculations. Owen was so convinced that he could make communism work 
that in 1823 he built communist colonies in Ireland for famine relief and to prove that his business-like communism could be successful. The technical working out of details was managed with such practical knowledge. He laid out ground plans, front and side, bird's eye view, everything was included. You know, blueprints for how people would live and work and sleep, etc. And educate their children, all of that. From the practical point of view, you really can't criticize what he had actually written down because it was really quite splendid. But it didn't work out. Now, Owen was reaching a turning point in his life. As long as he was simply a philanthropist, he was rewarded with nothing but wealth and applause, honor and glory. Everybody loved him. He was the most popular man in Europe. Not only men of his own class, but statesmen and princes listened to him approvingly. They called him for advice. But when he came out with his communist theories, oh, that was another thing. Three great obstacles seemed to him especially to block the path to social reform. What were they? Number one, private property. Number two, religion. And number three, the present form of marriage. Now, can you imagine if someone criticizes private property or criticizes Christianity or criticizes the form of marriage under Christianity, etc., will they be popular in the 19th century, in the early 19th century? Absolutely not. Owen was excommunicated. He knew he would be excommunicated. He knew he would be outlawed. He knew that he would lose his social position if he attacked property, religion and family. He knew that he would lose his wealth. He knew that he would no longer be a successful bourgeois if he had attacked these three major institutions of capitalist civilization. But without any fear of the consequences, he pitilessly attacked them, criticized them. And what was inevitably going to happen, happened. He was banished from official society, that is, from the upper classes. There was a complete conspiracy of silence against him in the press. He was ruined, sadly, by his unsuccessful communist experiments in the United States of America. He also took his communist colonies into America. He built them where he sacrificed all his fortune trying to build these communist colonies. So he was completely ruined by the end and the entire bourgeoisie, the press, everybody turned their back on Robert Owen. But he was not demoralized. He turned directly to the working class and continued working in their midst for the next three decades, for the next 30 years. He continued his struggle for the uplift of the working class. And that is why every social movement, every real advance in England on behalf of the workers links itself onto the name of Robert Owen. I was fortunate enough when I was doing my PhD in, um, in, in the United Kingdom that I visited some trade unions and what I saw, which really touched my heart because I'd already read all of this, was a beautiful statue of Robert Owen in front of their entrance. And it re made me really happy and it made me think of this particular passage, that wherever the workers of England or the United Kingdom make any advance, they always look back and salute Robert Owen for the great work that he did. After five years of fighting, he forced through, in 1819, the first women and child labor laws. He did it. He managed to get Parliament to approve laws about women's work, laws about women's rights, and laws about child labor. He became president of the first Congress at which all the trade unions of England united. Can you imagine? Now this is a capitalist, a bourgeois, and yet when all the trade unions of England came together, they said, Robert Owen is going to be our president. He introduced cooperatives and societies for retail trade and production. He introduced labor bazaars for the exchange of the products of labor through the medium of labor notes whose unit was a single hour of work. So basically, he introduced his own labor currency. I do not think that Robert Owen can be called an unsuccessful man, although people who were rich and people who were in the upper classes turned their back on him. But what he did for the poor and working class will resound and last in history. Now, as for the doctrines created by St. Simon, uh, Charles Fourier, and Robert Owen, Engels says they were like 
rounded pebbles in a brook. They had no clarity. They were uh, created in an atmosphere in which broad unity was being sought and uh, clarity of ideas, scientific clarity of ideas was not really being sought. So, you know, all sorts of contradictory ideas were mixed up and mashed together like a bit of a khichdi and they became, they had no definiteness in them. They had no clarity in them. That's why Engels calls them rounded pebbles in a brook. By the way, when I think about socialism in Pakistan, I often think of this phrase, rounded pebbles in a brook, because Pakistanis, we're not a very theoretical people. We're not very scientific people either. We hardly know any science, really, at the end of the day. Um, we had one great scientist, uh, Dr. Abdul Salam, and aside from that, we've had some important figures, but we've never really had a strong link with science. And it's the same with social science, which is even more, I would argue, underdeveloped in Pakistan. And Largely, it is the same with socialist ideas within Pakistan. We have a very romantic association with socialism, but uh, as far as scientific socialism is concerned, it's conspicuous by its absence in Pakistan. Now, back to Europe. So for these utopian socialists, socialism was the expression of absolute truth, reason, and justice. It is only to be discovered to conquer all the world by virtue of its own power. You know, it's like uh, the reason will and the truth will come to conquer the world and that's that. There needs to be no politics in this. There needs to be no class struggle in this. You don't need to create a political party. You just need to educate people and things will automatically happen. It is independent, therefore, this form of socialism, of time, space, and of the historical development of man. It is a mere accident when and where it is discovered. And Engels thought, this can't be right. Society is evolving through various stages, economic stages, political and intellectual stages. And socialism must be an advanced stage in the development of mankind. It could not have come about in any epoch whatsoever. Every socialist came up with their own version of this absolute truth, which everybody was trying to find, depending on their own conditions, knowledge, and intellectual training. And all these absolute truths were always going to be mutually exclusive. And all of them were fighting with each other, leading to an eclectic mishmash average kind of socialism, allowing of the most manifold shades of opinion, critical statements, economic theories, pictures of future society that create a minimum opposition. So, you know, everything was phrased in a way that society would not be antagonistic to it instead of a clear scientific understanding of what really are the contradictions of society at that particular point in time. So Engel says that this was a mishmash created as a result of definite sharp edges of the individual constituents rubbing down in the stream of debate like rounded pebbles in a brook. That phrase that I spoke of earlier, which I so love. So that brings um, this particular lecture to, to, to an end. Now, Marx and Engels are going to substitute instead of utopian socialism, which was not based on the class struggle, but based on the idea that all we have to do is grasp reason in order for socialism to come about. That they thought was a utopian idea. They are going to posit in its place scientific socialism. So here are some questions that you can think of uh, or you can try and answer in the context of this particular passage. Why did Marx and Engels consider the earliest socialist utopian? I already gave you the answer several times, but here it is again. And what did the leaders of the French Revolution hope to achieve? And what, how did the French Revolution go wrong? What were the slogans of the French Revolution? What was the disappointment with the French Revolution? Also, in what way did Saint Simon's concept of class differ from Engels' idea of nobility, bourgeoisie, and proletariat? How is Saint Simon's concept of class different from the concept of class given by Marx and Engels? Last, let's think about. Why were Robert Owen's efforts doomed to failure? Uh, what, what is the possible reason that Engels gives or that you can give? Why was Robert Owen not going to be successful despite the incredible planning that he undertook? Last but not least, Engels heaps praise on St. Simon Fourier and Owen. What exactly does he credit each of them with having achieved? And what aspects of the writings of St. Simon Fourier and Owen can be found in the writings of Marx and Engels. I'll leave you with those questions. Thank you and see you next time.